Okay, so we, we know what to eat, we know when to eat. Now we're going to look at some problems you might run into. Better to be forewarned is to be forearmed. So first of all, we're going to cover the main problems that you can get with low carbohydrate ketogenic diets. And then we're going to look at how to keep track of things and what things to keep track of. But first of all, the problems. And more than not, they're more emotional than anything else. The first problem I see is people think go into helplessness. <laughs> I can't do that. Well, that's too hard. Well, I don't know how many carbohydrates are in that. I can't be bothered figuring it out. Do you know what I mean? So if you're going to helplessness, just wake up, grow up. Give yourself some you know, pat on the back and say, you can handle this and go back to the section you need to get back to if you need to more input and to clarify the input and to just know that what you need to do so you're not helpless. The next problem is rebellion. Oh, hey, you know, that's that's a great idea, Derek, but, you know, there's no way I'm going to do that. I just hate that idea. I just won't do it. If you recognize that voice in yourself, then again, it's time to grow up and not being a kid and not being a teenager about this. You know, helplessness is kind of like the baby state. Rebellion's teenager to young adult. Some, some people never grow out of that one. But, uh, you know, again, we have to grow up. We have to know what's good for us and learn to take steps. And adulthood is just a process of growing into that, isn't it? But there's another problem, which is addiction. And I say addiction is both of those things. It's, I can't do this and I won't do it. Because basically food is really addictive. And this is a showing of what uh, sugar and cocaine does in the, in the brain. It lights up the same area as the brain. You know, um, sugar lights up the dopamine pathway, so that feel-good hormone. So, and then you need more and more uh, sugar to stimulate the same amount of dopamine. And that's why, you know, obese people sometimes don't feel as satisfied with food as they just, it just takes them more to get the same amount of dopamine out. So food can be a real addiction. Remember I talked about food fixes. Uh, there can be a really minor issue for you, or it can be a really severe issue. And that you need to pay attention to what happens when you're feeling good, when you're getting the results you want, and then you have that little thought. Remember, a little of this won't hurt. What happens after you act on that thought? Does it? If you have a severe biochemical addiction, if you notice that if you have one graham cracker or one cookie or one bit of apple or one grape, or one glass of wine, and then that leads to a cascade that can take you weeks, days, months to get out of, then that's called a severe biochemical addiction. And as in all addictions, it's that one day at a time. For today, I will do this. Don't think about tomorrow. It creates more anxiety. Just focus on today. Focus on this meal, the one I'm going to have right now. Now, if it's not so severe, it may just take you a few days to get back on track and then you can indulge a little bit when you want and then get back on track as soon as you can. And uh, I know that was my process at the beginning. I would come and go and I'd have I'd get really good and then I'd have a day which would lead me down. Maybe, you know, sometimes it did take me more than a week to get back on track. So there was part of me that has that addictive process going on. And I really had to, over time, it just gets easier and easier to deal with it. So that's, a, that's the real, you know, when in terms of handling battles, the battle for your mind is two parts. One of it is internal, and that's both a philosophical thing. It's, a, you know, what's right, what's wrong to eat, all that kind of, you know, we're trying to eat according to what's healthy. And then it's also that internal addictive process. So you need to watch both of those pieces, and it's a journey. And the, the more you dig into this education, uh, I've tried to point you to all the people I've learned from. Learn from them. Go to them and you know, dig out things from them and read. Treat it as an ongoing study, really, because N equals 1 isn't just the, the food. It's about getting yourself wise, and wise means paying attention to who's saying and, and also knowing who to pay attention to and who not to. And that's where this other piece comes in. The battle for your mind is actually external as well. The media is terrible at this. Anything that's sensational, they will slam it right in front of your face, try to 
hold your eyes open a bit like that clockwork orange guy that you know to you know stop him hurting people he had to get his eyes you know forced open and look at horrible things and get you know to actually traumatize him by seeing what he was doing with all the chemicals you know they put chemicals in their brain I think at the same time and that's kind of what the media does to us when it focuses on the drama and doesn't tell us the truth and remember what I said before if you see that they're saying don't eat this it'll kill you and it's an epidemiological and observational study you can you know what to do remember you just forget about it don't even think about it and if you do want to think about it then go to the source come back to you know I'll, I'll have you know sources telling you basically go back to sources that you trust like when I, that happens to me I'll I'll either I know enough in my own research now that I don't need to worry about it or if there's pieces I'm not quite sure about I'll actually listen to well what's what's someone I trust saying about that so then I I listen to them more than I'll listen to the news report I recommend you do the same so if you can handle those things then you can do this diet you'll want to do this diet and you won't be traumatized by the diet you're actually you'll find that you're food member of the vicious cycle or the supportive wheel once it becomes a supportive wheel you want more of that because feeling good is still a really really good thing so what to look out for these are we're starting to look at results right and the results at the beginning are going to be around how you feel so here we go you're actually looking at either reducing your carbohydrates increasing your fat and you've either gone zero carb Low carb, you've either gone, you know, with meat, without meat. You've done, done. You're choosing that, and then the first thing you should start to see is you should start to see a reduce in hunger. And partly this, remember the Goldilocks principle: eating to satisfaction. I say we've been playing the hunger game with ourselves. We've been forced, you know, forcing ourselves to eat less. If we've had any problems, like I had, with long-term, I mean, my weight bounced from. 60 something to 80 something kgs so it's not massively obese but it's very overweight and you know that was between you know as once i'd fully grown you know 17 something like that through to my mid 40s i, I bounced around like that i yo-yoed between 64 and 84 kgs and then when i got into um, the low carb high fat I bounced around but it was in a tighter curve you know it was maybe between 64 and 70 so it was still you know a good 10 pounds up and down but then it just got tighter and tighter and tighter so but in the process you know I was wasn't eating to satisfaction it took me a long time to learn to eat to satisfaction and it might take you time as well or you might just jump straight into it but just be aware that you know, partly your hunger reduces because you're eating to satisfaction. The other reason your hunger reduces is you're not stimulating insulin. Remember, insulin acts like Mr. Scrooge on your energy source. It'll lock it down so you want to eat something sooner. And it shuts down leptin so you don't get that satisfied thing. So it all kind of comes back to that process of limiting the carbohydrates. You'll find, you should find if you're limiting them enough that your hunger just isn't, becomes a non-issue. The second thing you should notice is your energy levels should increase and that's physical, emotional, mental energy. And isn't that what we're all looking for? And when you can feel that good just from your choice of foods, that's when you're really driving that supportive wheel and you're actually using your food to do what it should do, which is fix the processes in your body. This food's meant to be that nutrients for repair and maintenance and regeneration. And once you get that right, then that's what you experience. No little hunger, sometimes no hunger and energy, meaning, meaning that you can just get on with your day and I can go to work and work for hours. If my mind's engaged, I just don't feel hungry. You know, if I tend to also be uh, uh, an emotional eater if I'm, you know, there's nothing else to do. Well, food's a good option. So I have to watch that. So that's part of, and, but if I'm not hungry, then it's easier to say, oh, well, let's do something else rather than go eat. Make sense? Next thing I love this is waistline. And uh, by waistline, I do mean the area around your belly button, 
I don't mean like a lot of men, they think, well, my, I've got the same waistline as I had when I was 20. It's just that they've got, they've got their belt below their big belly that's hanging out over the place. And that's not the same thing as the waistline. Your waistline is that big belly. And remember the visceral fat inside it as well. So you should see your waistline reduce. And the first week, this is something to look out for. If you do get things like headache, fatigue, dizziness, heart palpitations, irritability, you know, we remember I talked about salt before, about us being taught to eat low salt. Well, generally they call this the keto flu. I don't know why I got that name, but they call it the keto flu because it has, you feel those kind of things when you have flu. But a simple solution is really to drink extra water and salt. So bone broth is good like that. Uh, but you can just like uh, have a glass of warm water with um, half a teaspoon or a teaspoon of salt mixed in it, drink it down, and then drink more water as you go. Because it's a problem of dehydration. Because remember, when you, when you limit carbohydrates, remember, the kidneys can then let go of salt. So your kidneys let go of salt, do what they always wanted to do. And then you get low salt content in your body. You're, you get less blood attracted to that because the water follows the salt and then you get low blood pressure and you get all those kind, of, those kind of symptoms. So increasing your salt is a big part. If you've experienced that in the first week or month, then go ahead and do that. And your waist to height ratio, you want to aim for a one, uh, one to two, and we'll cover that more on the next slide. But this is like the idea of increasing your fat as you go. So you can see there that the purple line at the top is the energy input coming down. So you basically will need less energy. As you get slimmer, your body needs less energy to deal with the size of your body. You know, fat requires energy to maintain. So you'll actually need to eat less, you know, have less energy intake. But you can see there the, the red is the carbohydrate, the green is the protein, and the yellow is the fat. And why do you think that I'm increasing the fats as I go and I'm increasing the carbohydrates but the protein is staying the same? Well, generally eating to satisfaction, we eat the right amount of protein. And the increase in carbohydrates is if you started at 20 grams and you've had to gone up to 50 to get to your carbohydrate tolerance level and you're staying there, that's great. That red may have actually gone down. You may have started at 20 and found you needed to go to 10 or zero to 10. So that red will then have gone down. But you don't need to add a lot of fat at the beginning because what you're trying to do is this: the yellow represents the amount of fat you've added into your diet, so you've put into your mouth. Whereas that space between the top of the yellow and that purple line show all that extra energy came out of your body, out of your body's fat stores. Because remember, when you reduce the insulin, you unlock the key to the vault. You get that energy available. So Mr. Scrooge is no longer able to, is not there to actually keep the vault locked down. So you have unlimited access to fat. And, uh, and you use that up, and then as you find you come more down to your goal weight, that one to two ratio, then you'll find you need to increase the fat content in the food you put in because you haven't got so much fat to draw on. That's how that works. A little more about salt. I didn't know about salt until a several months or a year or two into doing this diet and then all of a sudden I started to feel tired, less energy. And so as well as you know headaches, fatigue, dizziness in the beginning, if you find you're getting you know further and you had some good energy at the beginning but then as you go along you find you're getting tired again, maybe it's that old thing salt again. So you need to add more salt. And another way it comes up and this sometimes shows up right at the beginning or it shows up later is cramping. Like I remember having to uh, waking up at night with uh, both my calf muscles completely seized up. And for most people, it's salt that does it, sodium chloride. So when I added more salt into my diet, the cramps went. Other people may need some things like magnesium or different kind of issues, or they may need to reduce their coffee. Um, but salt and 90% of the issues will generally solve it. So don't limit salt and if it, you get those symptoms at the beginning or you get symptoms of low energy or cramps as you go along then the first thought should be ah oh, maybe i need some more salt and the way to go 
let's look at this waste to height ratio. And in terms of in terms of a simple measurement you can do, so it's, it is the measurement around your waist, around your belly button, and it really wants to be, as you can see on this graph, pretty close to half. So if you're two meters tall, your waist is a meter. Makes sense? You got, you got that idea in mind? And basically this is showing, no, you know, the amount, this is different, different, the different colored lines are about ages. And then it's basically, it's about, you know, life expectancy. And basically they show that, you know, the more you're, uh, as you get older, because those see those different colors, as you get older and as you get fatter, like you know, if your waist is, you know, more and more close to your height ratio, then you die sooner. That's basically it. So it's the simplest longevity measurement you can think of. And so rather than dealing with the scales, which can traumatize people, I generally recommend just this one simple body measurement. You can look at the whether your clothes are looser. That's a simple way women can do it. Uh, men, again, if they can use their belt if they're honest about where their belt actually needs to sit. Otherwise, they need to look at really make sure they measure that that waist to height ratio, and keep a track of that. Because and remember that as you do reduce that, you're coming to that point where you know you're actually improving your test for longevity, and that really is a solid measurement right there. As well as the tape measure, the next thing is to look at is your blood test, and you know we used to our ideas about cholesterol. Are changing massively and they're changing literally as we speak um, there's a great talk with uh, Professor Ken Sakaris from Melbourne uh, he's a you know, hematologist he does work with bloods and uh, you know he says like 30 years ago it was high cholesterol was important triglycerides were unimportant 20 years ago it was all about the bad cholesterol good cholesterol idea 10 years ago it was all about the modified you know the, what types of bad cholesterol there is that oxidation glycation process we've talked about, um, and then today we're starting to realise that you know 30 years ago triglycerides were unimportant. Today the, we're starting to realise the tests we're doing have been totally off the wall, and but triglycerides are really important, and particularly that triglyceride HDL ratio. So it's Professor Ken Sakaris, and so you want to get these tests, and so and I'll I'll sh I'll show you what. Um, uh, what parameters we're looking for on the next slide, but you know HbA1c. Remember that's the glycated hemoglobin. Uh, the fasting triglycerides. You do want to get fasting because you. Some most people will do in New Zealand. I think in Australia, they'll do a standard triglyceride blood test, which is non-fasting. So you actually get a better marker of your triglycerides if you do fasting. And uh, then the other tests are. This is uh, particularly fatty liver ALTs for fatty liver. Base, you know, basically, if your if a, if your liver starts getting damaged, remember fructose goes in there, the overloads the mitochondria. You get fatty liver. Remember, you saw those rats. Um, uh, what's happening there is that the muscle, the liver cells are dying, and when they die, they release certain everything in the in their contents, and one of those contents is a is an enzyme that's specific to the liver cell. So if that is raised, it means, it doesn't mean just mean to say you're putting out more of that, it means that the liver cells are dying and it's showing up and that enzyme showing up in your blood more and more. So fatty liver is, is a big deal for that. So there is a page on my website called which blood tests are important. If you go into the search bar and you'll find that, you just type in which bloods are important and it'll take you there. And uh, so, Fasting triglycerides, like Ken says, wants to be below 1, and that triglyceride HDL ratio wants to be under 0.87. And as you'll see the, the videos in there I brought that actually help you. If you don't have to just believe me, please don't. Make sure you actually understand that this is solid information coming from solid people. Uh, the HbA1c you want under 5.6. Even diabetics can aim for that range rather than the standard 7 they think is good management. Uh, under, you can actually get under 5.6. Um, fasting insulin is a test. We're not, we're not really doing 
the, like the glucose tolerance insulin test like we should do. And I'll tell you more about that in a minute. But um, liver enzymes, remember, they want to be low because remember, if they're high, it's not just that your body's producing more, it's your liver's dying and all those enzymes are getting released into the blood from the dead blood cells, the dead, sorry, liver cells. So um, that's, that's not a good sign. That's where they see fatty liver as just a disaster. Um, you know, there are kids now in, um, in Scotland getting liver transplants because they've just drunk too much sugary soft drinks. It's just insane what we do. Uh, and then the glucose tolerance insulin response. That's a really good test, but most, most of it we just do the glucose tolerance and don't really measure the insulin. And like insulin resistance develops over years. I took the slide from Paul Mason. And you can see in the blue line, the blood glucose goes up. And you can see the, the red line is the insulin levels. So you can see that already a long time ago, they started to depart in you know, ways. And the insulin started to get more and more and more. And at a certain point, the insulin goes down, but the sugar goes up. So the insulin job, remember, is to keep the blood sugar down, the blood glucose down. And when it can't do that anymore, it's produced more than it needed to because it's just, remember, you're getting hyperinsulinemia. You're stacking that subway cars, the trains full of sugar, and you need more insulin to push that sugar in more. So you've already done that damage. And now when that curve starts to come down, when that red line starts to come down, that's your pancreas dying. And one of the other ways your pancreas dies, remember the glycation of uh, hemoglobin and the glycation of LD leading to, you know, leading to you know, poor energy levels with the hemoglobin and the glycation of LDL leading, picking up those, those um, glycated uh, fats, fat lipoproteins, the bad, bad cholesterol, picked up by the macrophages and that becomes the fatty walls in the artery. The same thing happens in the pancreas. So it's kind of ironic in a way that the, the sugar that actually stimulates the insulin that's supposed to handle the sugar actually damages, the, the sugar damages the, the proteins in the pancreas around the structures that the beta, you know, the pancreatic beta cells that produce insulin. So you damage those cells and there's some evidence to show that if you get it early enough you can actually re recover some of that damage but this is just showing you that you know insulin takes a while to you know come through that point but the glucose tolerance test only really measures the blue line not the red line and that's where you want to look at a test that does both and dr paul mason talks about this there's another researcher i think he's just dead now he's, he was lived well into his 90s before he died uh, dr joseph Kraft, and um uh, Ivor cummins who you'll hear more about in the next slide uh is quite big on because joseph Kraft found there was five different responses different groups of people ways of responding to a carbohydrate load with the amount of insulin and essentially if you overreact, if you're the kind of person that produces way too much insulin for a glucose road load, and that goes on for a longer period of time, and as you age, that gets worse and worse and worse, then that's the kind of people that are heading to diabetes quicker. And so the whole idea of doing an uh, the glucose tolerance and the insulin resistance, the insulin levels at the same time, that's the test you really want to look at because it, you can be can take a long time to get to that point of having enough blood glucose that you're called diabetic or pre-diabetic, you're likely pre-diabetic. You could save yourself years. You can see that process here has gone over like 15, 25 years. And if you can save yourself years and, and not damage your pancreas as much, if you get that sooner. And the only way to do that is to get proper testing. And if you're just getting tested with um, a glucose, a standard glucose tolerance, that's not enough. You need to ask for something more. And then if you've been through all that and you're, 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 you're not quite sure of your blood tests or, you know, you, you've, because what happens when you do um, increase the fat in your diet, your, your cholesterol will go up because that's, cholesterol is just, you know, it's most of your cholesterol is produced by your body. 70 to 80 percent of your cholesterol is produced by your body. It's in every cell wall, it's in certain hormones. It's just, you know, it's an important molecule. That's why you do. Your body does produce 80 percent of it. Uh, so, you don't want to limit it. You actually want to 
have it just be good so you don't oxidize it and you don't glycate it because those things are the problem. But if you're still concerned, like if, um, if your triglyceride level is good, if your HDL triglyceride level is good, uh, but you still have a question mark, then you can go ahead and do what's called a coronary artery count. And um, Ivor Cummins, I mentioned before, he's got a site called fatemperor.com. Uh, he's supported by the Irish Heart Foundation. It's great that the Irish Heart Foundation is getting behind this. And uh, they recommend the coronary artery count. It's basically, you can see uh, the picture where you can see the white line showing is the calcification in an artery. And essentially, the more calcified your artery is, the worse it is for you. And I think we all know that. And basically you want to test it and you want to get the same kind of test over time. So having one test will tell you whether you have a problem or not and there's plenty of people in the zero carb movement and the low carb movement who are getting these tests. The blood tests um, all show good but they might have high total cholesterol so they just want to double check how their heart is and they realize oh my heart's fine no no coronary artery build up and so therefore those high LDL levels are actually the good LDL. That's one way they can know for sure. And then they get them retested and they see how they're progressing. You can actually find your coronary artery score gets better over time with cleaning up your diet. And that's, like I said, the visceral fat goes first, so that creates a lot of less inflammation. And then you're cutting down the amount of oxygen glycation on the LDL and the body has time to deal with all that. And res I guess it just reabsorbs it. And that's, uh, that's a fantastic thing. You can actually reverse it. But it's important to do the same test. So if you get a uh, coronary artery count with one lab, you want to make sure if you get it done with the second one with another lab, you want to make sure they use the same process because there's a couple of different processes I believe they can use. So keep a check on that. And Ivor Cummins is a good one to listen to that. Now remember I talked about medication. This is really important to get to because you can die if you get your medication wrong. And how does that happen uh, with going low carb? Well, if you're on insulin or an insulin releasing drug, like a sulfonylurea, then your body's being told by the drug, to, it's either you're either giving it insulin or you're actually giving it a drug that makes the body produce more insulin. So you're, me you're mechanically adding more insulin to the system. And then if you cut back on your carbohydrates, then you could have a massive problem of having, if you don't reduce it, the insulin at the same time. And most diabetics are pretty good at measuring their blood glucose and measuring the insulin they need as a result of that. And, and this is also where it's good to have your diabetologist or whoever you're talking to about your diabetes medication on board with what you're doing. And what this is showing now is that you may have to reduce your insulin by as much as 50% on the very first day that you go on to say a 20 gram a day budget. And so you want to be aware of that because the last thing you want is to go into hypoglycemia because hypoglycemia can be lethal. And uh, I'm sure if, you've, if you're diabetic, you may have already and on insulin or insulin releasing drugs, you may already have experienced that. So you know what it feels like and you just need to be aware that you need to pay extra special attention to that. The other thing that can be a problem with going low carb is if you're on antihypertensives. Remember I said that uh, the more you reduce the carbs, the more you reduce the insulin, then the salt has a chance to get out of your body. And then what happens is you might start to feel dizzy because your antihypertensives are pushing your blood pressure even further. So it goes lower and lower and lower to the point where you feel faint when you stand up. And that's the point where you need to talk to your doctor and you know, warn them before you do this. So you have a conversation with them about how to handle that process if it happens. So by all means, you know, pay real attention to both these things because the last thing you want to do is die just by trying to get well. I'm sure you agree with that. Now, if I had diabetes, there's a page on my website. Again, you can go into the search bar there and, and type in if I had diabetes and you take your, you know, to thumb something like this and you'll get a page come up like that. And then you just lock into that page and 
all the resources I have there, actually, if I had diabetes, I would be following those advices. And there are people like um, Dr. Richard Bernstein and a few other diabetic doctors who have learned to handle their diabetes meds and uh, reduce them massively or eliminate them with, um, uh, with how much um, they're changing their diet. And you know, obviously type 1 diabetics will always need some because the body just can't produce any and type 2 diabetics will often need get back to needing none at all. So you can actually really massively reverse diabetes doing this or make it easy, much more easily managed. And same thing with blood pressure. Again, some doctors in there that uh, you know have managed that for themselves, and then you can learn to manage yourself. But do remember to stay in touch with your medical doctors, the people that prescribe those drugs, and help you manage that whole journey of reducing them if you need to. And you do need to be aware that, particularly with insulin, you may need to reduce it as much as 50% on the first day. So you need to know that before you do it. And that's why I put it in this section. Now this slide, I saved the lives of 150 people through heart transplants. If I'd cared about preventative medicine earlier, I would have saved 150 million people. Professor Christian Barnard, famous you know, heart transplant surgeon. And uh, who was this quote by? Who, who brought this to my attention? His granddaughter, Karen Thompson, uh, came out in the low-carb movements in South Africa. Uh, and her main issue was addiction, drug addiction, carbohydrate addiction. And so she really had to remember I said if you've got a severe biochemical addiction, you really need to pay attention to that and work with it as an addiction. And that's a, that's a process. It doesn't happen overnight, but it can be done. And I just wanted to leave you this section with this slide just to show you how much we can change public health. Here's Christian Barnard's statement, 150 lives or 150 million. And that's kind of what we've done. It's actually in the billions. I think there's, what, 7 billion people? How many billion are overweight? It's unimaginable what medicine has done in terms of promoting that as a healthy diet when they really should have done the research. And hopefully now you understand it, you'll be able to take those steps you need to take. And um, re-educate your doctors if you need to, but get yourself on a real track to health and well-being.